Aia. Aia. Andua kwa murega. Murega ringi. Asante ni sana. Tumekaa tunakuwa tunashangilia tunaangalia mlima. Na mimi hapo chini nimeangalia nimeona nyuso mingi zaidi. Ambapo mimi najua karibu kila mesa nikisabu hapa najua watu hapo. Kwa hivyo mimi najihisi niko nyumbani. <laughs> Nataka kuanza kutoa shukrani kwa viongozi wa Mount Kenya Foundation. Kwa juhudi ambayo wamefanya kuleta sisi pamoja. Hii sasa ni mara ya pili ah karibu mara tatu ambayo wameandaa karamu kama hii na tukapata fursa ya kuonana na marafiki yetu na ndugu zetu kutoka mlima Kenya. Mbeni mwezi mmoja na kitu iliyopita tulikuwa hapa hapa. Na viongozi kutoka mlima Kenya wa Mashariki na tukasherekea hapa tukala tukanyweshwa mpaka tukashiba na tena sasa wameamua wakaturudisha tena hapa mimi natoa shukrani kubwa sana kwao kwa kufanya haya so but i'm happy to be among friends here and patriotic kenyans listening to those who have spoken here before me or say that all of them are people who have got the interest of this country at heart i'm not going to respond to all the issues that have been raised some of them are issues which i've already covered extensively in some of the policy statements that have issued as you will have noticed every sunday I come up, I take a particular subject, and I put my views about it, and I release it for discussions. So I expect to get reactions from people that when we prepare our final manifesto, all those issues have been discussed and have been agreed on. <laughs> Just to talk briefly about the, the mountain. Now, juicy. I was invited by the governor of Laikipia to go to Laikipia. Before that, I'd been invited by the governor of Nakuru. And that's where I went to Nakuru, and that's where I launched the Azimio Ya Umoja wa Kenya. And after that, uh, last week, we were again back in Nakuru with him. We had uh, the funeral of uh, a friend of ours. Then again, I went to, on a Saturday, I was in um, uh, Elementator, where I met a group of uh, uh, religious leaders at a conference. They, they called uh, the Israeli Churches of Kenya, which includes the Akurino, also Legion Maria and several other, other churches. And then from there I flew over the Nyandarua uh, plains and the Happy Valley, the, the colonies call it the Happy Valley, into Laikipia. And there in Laikipia um, we had a good discussion with my friend the governor of Laikipia, and um, I was very impressed by the kind of work he's doing for his, in his, his county. But before I come there, the, this region here, this is a very unique region of Kenya. And uh, I, I, I gave a story when I was there. Uh, how the settlers came to our country. That there was the Lord Delamere who had come on a horseback. He went through the horn 
Africa, then through Somali, he was riding on a horse and came to, through Mount Kenya. And then he came from there down towards Nairobi, then passed and went through Nyahururu, what then went down to Thompson Falls. He went to Naivasha, Na, Na, Gilgil, Nakuru, Elbagon, Njoro, Molo, up to Eldoret, Kitale, up to Mount Elgon. And was very impressed by what he saw. So when he came back and had discussions with the colonial government, I said that this is a very rich highland which is ripe for large-scale farming. The railway line has been constructed. It was then called the Lunatic Express. But for this railway line to be viable and repay back the investment, you need to have large-scale agriculture so that when the trains come and go to the west, on the way back to the port, they will have things to carry back. The colonial government agreed. Then he told them that he can go back to England and bring settlers who can come and introduce large-scale agriculture. But for him to do that, he said he needed to be assured that anybody he brought here will be given 10,000 acres free and free black, black labor, laborers. The colonial government agreed, he exacted that ag 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 agreement. So armed with that agreement, he went back to England to recruit settlers. He had town hall meetings in London, in Manchester, in Birmingham, in Liverpool, telling them that, look, down there, we have a land that is flowing with milk and honey. Mana. And anybody who agrees to come will get 10,000 acres free with the black laborers. But at that time, the story about Africa was very negative. Oh, Bilhazia, malaria, wild natives. So nobody wanted to come to Africa. So in frustration, he got very few who wanted to come. In frustration, he came back. When he came back, he decided to try down south. So he sailed, went on a ship from Mombasa to Durban. In Durban, he addressed a town hall meeting. From there, he went to Port Elizabeth, East London. Cape Town, Kimberley, Joburg. There he found Wazungus who had lived in Africa for generations and who did not fear Africa. Some of them were actually workers or laborers and other fellow white owned farms. So the prospect of owning their own farm was very appealing. So they quickly agreed most of them from South Africa and from what was called Rhodesia, Southern Rhodesia. That's how we ended up with the Kaburus here. When they came, they were given land from Timau, from those other sides on Kenya East, all the way to Kitale, Mount Elgon, those sides. That is what became known as the White Highlands. That is how the people of all this region were deprived of their land. How they were deprived of their land. So now the Africans were being conscripted to work. There was what they call agreement. You sign an agreement to go and work in the, those farms. And you'll have to work for at least six months. Firstly, but if you absconded, 
you will be, they will come and look for you right home and arrest you. And you will be taken to prison. So that is how the people of this region were deprived of their land. And that is really the background. Most of those who came here were said illiterate or semi-illiterate. They were just thumb printing. They were very ruthless, the natives. They call the niggers. So the niggers were completely deprived people. I will come to the, back to that subject later. But that is how we came to, to be what we were. And you find a place like Nyahururu, there's a place they call the Happy Valley, where they're doing all sorts of things. But what is, I say what attracted them was that the land was good for agriculture. The one even though today, agriculture is still a major occupation in that area. But because the land had been taken away, that's where the people from those, uh, those areas started very early trading. Uh, because most of the land were taken away, some of them were taken into uh, emergency villages and so on and so forth. And that, that's how that culture of trade started. So agriculture is uh, the main occupation. They grow tea, those are the cash crops. Coffee, you've got uh, vegetables, you've got flowers. There used to be pyrethrum, which is limping now. Fruits, milk is another one. You know the Laikipia, that name comes from the Maasai clan of Laikipia. The, the ones who remained. But then a big part of it is plateau. And Wazungus wanted to introduce large scale uh, ranching. So the agreement they signed with the Renana to get the Maasai out over there. And around, Lake, and around Naivasha there, they put a 10 mile corridor. Because they had already introduced the hybrid cows. Yeah, so they say the Maasai, 10 mile corridor for the Maasai to pass with their changing zombies to go down to Narok and, and Kajiato. <laughs> uh, but then now, uh, this, but the people in these areas are basically, in the rural areas, are, are farmers. And um, but in order to, for this to be sustainable, you need first to deal with the issues of inputs. Here, the seeds, the fertilizers, and the pesticides are some of the things, the major inputs that you need to look at to make this thing viable. Secondly, you need to look at issues of access to the market and then the issues of, uh, of, of pricing, which actually depends on supply and demand. Then, uh, um, when I was there, and the governor, he arranged for me to meet with uh, the um, Traders, you see, the these traders, the MSMEs, the small and medium uh, enterprises, and he has done a wonderful job in promoting these micro, small, and medium enterprises. They are big, as he already told you the figures, and uh, is empowering them give them access to capital and also helping them access the markets. So I was very impressed by the de degree of innovation by those young Kenyans. 
um, the kind of machinery that they produce. They refine, for example, a machine that is being used to recycle plastic waste and make cabros out of the, the, the plastic waste. And several other building materials are made out of it. Cattle feeds and things like that. So many other things. So I was very, very impressed. So there's really no need to invent the wheel. We know that uh, these SMEs can eventually grow and become bigger enterprises. I told him that, you know, I am an engineer by profession. And I gave them examples of how many of these enterprises started as very small enterprises. I gave them the example of Mr. Mr. You know, Carl Calhans Benz. He was an engineer doing experiments with a first two-stroke, then a four-stroke cylinder engine. He developed it and eventually built a, a, a chassis, put it on the chassis, and um, put a transmission system so that he could convert the motion from the engine to the wheels. And then he started driving it. It was ta -ta 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 and people feared it. He asked people to come on with him when he was doing the first experiment, nobody wanted. Eventually his 17-year-old daughter agreed to go with the daddy. And they rode for 35 kilometers, then he stalled. They later on named that model after his daughter, who had agreed to risk her life to go with him. The daughter was called Mercedes. That is the story of Mercedes Benz. The man was called Karl Heinz Benz. But that's why sometimes we call it Mercedes Benz. The daughter was called Mercedes. And eventually now Mercedes became a household name. The same thing when Mercedes was doing, Benz was doing the experiment in Germany, next to him, not far away, another person was also doing the experiment, it was called Daimler. Eventually, Daimler and Benz came together. That's why sometimes it's called Daimler Benz. But at the same time, also Mr. Henry Ford, on the other side of Atlantic, was also doing experiments with the a four cylinder engine. He did the same thing like what Benz had done and put it on a chassis. Again, nobody wanted. He called it Ford T, T model. Nobody wanted to get into it. Women were quoted as saying that those crazy contraptions of Mr. Ford, no way. I'm safe on a horseback any day. People preferred the horse to the car. But eventually, that one of Mr. Mr. Ford also became uh, now an international model. Mr. Toyota was repairing car, uh, bicycles. Then he went into the scooter, assembling parts to make a scooter, which you know, became the, 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 the motorbike for women. Then he started, went to the motorbike. Eventually, he went to the, a four-stroke cylinder, uh, cylinder engine, which became then uh, Toyota. And uh, when Toyota was made in those days, you know, nobody wanted to buy Toyotas. When I was studying Germany, Japanese cars were banned that they did not meet the German safety standards. The first Toyota that was brought in this country were lying in the warehouses here. Nobody was buying them. Till they went 
and convinced two politicians, Dr. Nikonyo Kiano and Mr. Joseph Murumbi. They gave them free cars to drive so people could trust. So, and that's how they managed to enter this market here. Today, Tahoe is a household name internationally, all over the world. I was telling them also that when we were going to school, anything Japanese was known as inferior in quality. There was a, a, a cloth. If they made you a uniform with that cloth, which is called Japan, fellow uh, children in school would laugh at you. Uh, we went about to Japan. You had to buy and wear, wear Stuckford from England. Now, where in Japan is seen as high quality. So I was encouraging these people to say that we can also do it here. We don't need to be ashamed of what is made here in, in Kenya. And we also need to, don't need to reinvent the wheel. We know where we are coming from. In the days of colonialism, Africans were excluded from economic activities of our country. They are, they are, we are running a segregated society. There was a Mzungu, there was a Muhindi, then there was a Marabu, and then the, the African was down there, the lad. So if you are found with 100 shilling notes, you'll be arrested. Come Africa. So when independence came, the government came up with a policies to mainstream Africans into the economy. Now they came up with a policy called Africanization. Africanization was meant to help Africans to participate effectively in the economy of this country. They set up institutions, the ICDC, Industrial and Commercial Development Corporation, the um, uh, Nini, uh, KNTC, the Kenya National Trading Corporation. These institutions were tasked with the responsibility of giving Africans capital, loan, so that they could be able to participate meaningfully in the economy. They, later on, um, uh, I mean, Africanization was blamed as being racist. That was discriminating against other races. So it was changed to Kenyanization. Kenyanization. Then the government came up with a, a policy of um, many uh, to uh, take over, I mean, retail businesses. That if you are not a Kenyan citizen, you are not allowed to engage in retail businesses. You could be in manufacturing, wholesale, but retail businesses could only be done by uh, native Africans. That is the time, and that, that's when now, because there were some Indians, in colonial days we were all British subjects. Kenyan citizenship was created at independence. And um, the Nini, the uh, uh, Indians who had been brought as schoolies here were given the option of either becoming Kenyan citizens or retaining their British citizenship. Most of them retained British citizenship. They were told that if you're not a Kenyan, by, uh, I mean, a uh, 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 citizen, you cannot be engaged in retail businesses. And that is how Africans began to, to buy some of those Indian businesses, getting loans from KNTC and from ICDC. Then they also set up institutions here, like Kenya Industrial Estates was set up to help Africans to get into manufacturing. And that is how I became, a, myself, I became a beneficiary 
of the KIE process. I got a loan from ICDC to start my business. But how did I do it? I was then a teacher at the University of Nairobi, and there we had a, 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 a technician who was an Indian called I.G. Desai. So one day I.G. Desai came to me and told me that, you know, there is a Kala singer who has been chased away from Uganda by Idi Amin, and he has he had a workshop in Jinja, and he has uprooted the machinery and he has brought them here. They are somewhere in a, a house in Parklands. He is trying to sell because he's going to UK. And me, he was an electrical engineer. I cannot do anything with them, but you are a mechanical one. I think you can get, make use of them. So he took me to the, this Indian place in Parklands. And then I looked at those machinery, the old sheet metal working machines, the, the guillotine, there was uh, the lathe machine, the milling machines, the welding sets, and so on. I said, yeah, these are good machines. They were, he was selling them for 12,000 shillings. I didn't have. My salary was 2,000 shillings a month. So, um, but I had a, a, a car I'd brought f back from Germany, a left-hand drive Opel Cadet, <laughs> which I sold, and I got the money to pay the car singer. <laughs> that became my staging capital. Then I took this machinery, and I went and hired a workshop on then called Kingston Road. It's now called Kampala Road in the industrial area. And then started making ideal casements, doors and windows and all those things. I managed to get Kenyans who had also been sent away from Uganda, highly cool, skilled uh, manpower, whom I employed. And that's how I started. Then eventually, I was enabled, I managed to to get an order from an oil company, Ajib, to manufacture for them some cylinders, LPG cylinders for, for, for gas. And uh, after that, um, I, I met another German who was, the German government had come up here to help Kenya set up Kenya Industrial Estates. Kenya Industrial Estates was meant to help Africans get into manufacturing. So when I met this German, he came and looked at what I was having. And then he said, look, we are trying to make uh, industries out of laymen. Here's somebody who knows what he's doing. This project of yours qualifies for funding under the KIE. And that is how I went now to the Kenya Industrial Estates as an expansion project. And I got a loan to now buy modern machinery and begin modern manufacturing. The rest is history, is, is history now. <laughs> Why am I saying this story? I'm just trying to say that the government at that time was committed to helping Africans there was deliberate effort at that time to help Africans come up in businesses. And by the time the, the first regime was ending, there was an emergent African middle class in manufacturing, in banking, in insurance, and so on. These were basically killed later on through wrong policies and also the pressures from IMF and World Bank, liberalization, that killed very many businesses. But there was also an effort to try to promote foreign as opposed to local investment. 
So we've seen what uh, long policies can do to a country. You can you know how uh, uh, the consequences of those wrong policies. Because under the first regime of Kenyatta, we created a middle class, a middle class, a national bourgeois class was emerging. When the change came, they promoted what you call comprado class, briefcase business investment. Those who stand between capital and the no one who knows so and so, who knows so and so, who knows so and so. You want to register a company, a license. You want a manufacturing license. You need export license. For an exchange, you need license. So there are these briefcase people who they are the ones who know so and so who will give you this and that and that and that. That is what happened. So local manufacturing, local economy was killed for 24 years. 24 years. When we came into government with Kibaki, we decided to change it. We came up, to, we found almost a bankrupt treasury. And we decided to, 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 to change it and um, create an economy that was growing. The growth, the growth was negative when we came into government. We found the government was collecting 300 billion shillings. But then uh, it was a 500 billion shilling economy. The rest was coming from foreign donors all the times. Then we realized that, look, there was under collection because of corruption. Under corruption. You find those who are involved with revenue raising were so corrupt. The revenue officers, the procurement officers, those are the boys in town. They're the ones driving the latest model of cars, the one buying apartment blocks in town, the one who are building castles in rural areas, the ones who are building high-rise buildings in village markets. So we said we do a lifestyle audit. And we got all of them and removed them from the system. And we brought in the right people. Within no time, revenue shot up. We did not have to raise taxes. We retained them, but the revenue shot from 300 billion to 750 billion. <laughs> we went to 900. On the third year, we have reached a trillion shilling budget. I remember John Michuki coming to Kibaki and saying, Mr. President, we are having, for the first time, a one trillion shilling budget. And um, I was minister for roads. When we went in there, I came up with a road uh, construction program throughout the country. I traveled all over the country looking at the roads. I found that there were 9,000 kilometers of tarmac roads in the country. But 46% of it was dilapidated. So I said, I need money to repair what has been left neglected, at the same time to construct new ones. I did not have the money. So I need more money. And I appealed for more money. The opposition, but Dr. Mohisa Kitui in the cabinet told them that, look, if you want to have an impact in this government, let's give Raila more money. So let us launch 5% from each budget and put it in roads. Then we will have the impact. 
it was resolved. And that's how I got the money and started doing the roads. So uh, we planned, you will have seen, uh, the roads around the country, you will look at the bypasses in this, this city. When I was knocking them down, knocking houses which had been built on the bypasses, I was being accused. Raila is targeting Kikuyu uh, uh, <laughs> property. They want to impoverish the Kikuyus, and so on. I said, no, we want, we want to decongest the city center. And um, I was accused in the cabinet. I explained that, look, I told the chairman, Mr. President, this road reserves were declared as road reserves and gazetted in 1971. I came up with the gazette notices, and these people were compensated. But because no roads were constructed, they went and again and constructed, although they had been paid money by the government. But Mr. President, what we want to do is to decongest the city center. Uh, the Uhuru Highway is a major barrier. Most of the traffic on Uhuru Highway is transit traffic from east, from south to, to West and vice versa, or east to, to west. This, tra this traffic has no business in the city center. So if you build bypasses, the traffic from Mombasa going to western Kenya, Nakuru, Kisumu, Kampala, Rwanda, Burundi, and DRC will not need to come in through the, the city center and eastern bypass, and then the northern bypasses, and the link road. Then Kibaki says, Come about me, Jenga, Kabarabara, Ibamulewe. <laughs> oh, yes, what do you want us to do? <laughs> what do you want us to do? <laughs> and I come in, yeah, so Kibaki supported me. So I want you to know that we worked very closely with my Kibaki. The uh, border border people have had discussions with them. In fact, they, they came to see me. I know their problem, and I also know the solution to their problem. And we have discussed it. <laughs> also, the, I've talked of SMEs and those who um, depend on importation of goods and so on. I know their problems that they're going through. I had an occasion to talk to them two weeks ago. And I promised that what they were requesting, I was going to convey, and I've already conveyed it to the president. <laughs> but going forward, we need to promote our own. We need to look at...